Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is a day the Lord has made. Yes. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yep. It's easy to say on a beautiful day like this. Yes, Amen. A beautiful day in Southern Maryland. I'm looking around at all the beautiful people here. Good to see you all. So if you're if you're new here to a Leonard Town Church of the Nazarene, then welcome home. And if welcome. you're if you're uh, one of the members here, then you know, welcome back. Good to see you all. See some people settling in, so I'm going to give you a second. It's my honor and privilege to be able to uh, to pray with you all today and uh, share some scripture with you. Pastor Mike is going to be coming up shortly. He's going to be talking to us about the uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's a story I think uh, a lot of folks are familiar with. I'd like to share that with you if I may. And I'll even put glasses on just to make sure I can see every word. <laughs> Technology. I'm gonna be sharing with you from my, uh, my new version app. In Luke 10, Chapter 25 begins, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho, and when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side, so too a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, almost a day's pay. He gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. When I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Father in heaven, we come to you today giving you praise, giving you honor. We are so thankful for your word. It gives us wisdom. It gives us pause. It gives us peace. It gives us a glimpse into your love, God, how to love each other, how to love you, God. We thank you for this opportunity to come together in your love. We thank you for these precious things that you give us, all the blessings that we don't want to ignore. We thank you for this beautiful day, for these people that are gathered here to hear a word from you, God. We thank you for your son and for all that you've done. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus gives us a promise in his word. And that promise is that we will, once we leave this earth, we'll be with him in eternity. And while we're here, we can have a wonderful relationship with him. And this morning we're going to start off with when we all get to heaven. So please join us.
lady. Uh, let's see, what do we got next? How about that old song, uh, Blessed Assurance? Can we do that this morning? Yes. Man, that's another good one. It is, it is. family uh, prayer time, so let us uh, bow our heads and pray together. Uh, dear Lord, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. Um, thank you for all your blessings uh, in, in this community, in this church, and for all the uh, all the answered prayers, Lord, all the all the things you do in our lives, the, the hope, the peace, the joy that you give us each day. Uh, we've had, uh, we do have some concerns in our in our church family, Lord, and we look those up to you today. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. We especially think about um, Anna today and, and uh, Stacy, Sean, Junior, and Chris. Um, 
we lost uh, Shannon this week, Lord, and that was a, a shocking, heartbreaking moment for all of us uh, to find that out. But we know, Lord, that even in the midst of these these tough times, that we can still find your peace. And we pray that you would um, just <clears throat> we pray that you would just uh, bring them peace and comfort today, Lord, and, and hope and encouragement for the future, and that uh, the body of Christ will be present in these moments, and that they will. Uh, shower them with, with love and compassion and uh, do all that we can, Lord, to, to be there for them. And I also pray for Anna as she deals with all the logistical challenges and things like that, um, that you would just give her pa uh, patience and, and wisdom and direction, Lord, as, as she deals with uh, these tough times in the next few weeks and going forward. Um, Lord, we pray that all we say and do here today would only bring you glory and honor. I pray that the words that come, come out of my mouth, Lord, would, would be from you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Excuse me. Love you, Pastor Mike. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Once again, it's a beautiful day to be here. My name is Mike Curley. For those that don't know me, I'm doing my best to fill some some pretty big shoes today with Pastor Paul. Uh, he's had another important important commitment today, so. Um, Thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to share the word with you. I am a local district minister on the Mid-Atlantic District, yeah. uh, as far as a few of my uh, other mates here. So um, I want to throw out a quick announcement real quick. We, next weekend, we have Pastor Edmund Bullock and his wife, Gisela, coming into town um, <clears throat> to lead us to worship from Friday through Sunday. So Friday and Saturday, they're going to be down at the wharf at 6 p.m., and Saturday, uh, Pastor Bullock will be here preaching the message at 10 a.m. here on the square. So uh, please come and join us there. Now, Jim uh, has already read the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And uh, today, that's what my message is going to be centered around. Uh, even if you haven't, haven't heard the parable or don't recall uh, reading it any time in recent history, surely you've heard the term uh, used before, Good Samaritan. <clears throat> at some point or probably several points in your life. So some examples, you know, a good, a good Samaritan stopped to assist an injured person. And a good Samaritan was walking by and saw smoke and fire coming from the house and they ran in to make sure nobody was inside uh, and so on. So we all kind of have an idea in our minds as to what it means to be a good Samaritan. But how similar is our definition of a good Samaritan to the character in the parable? <clears throat> Excuse me. And how, how often do we limit the scope of who our neighbors are and essentially ask, and who is my, who is my neighbor? Um, so upon reading this parable, we can take away some obvious truths, but if we look closer, we will see that there is a, a reason that G Jesus mentions the specific characters and the locations that he does in this parable. Verse 25, we read, On one occasion, an expert of law stood up to test Jesus. This lawyer was most likely a Pharisee, and up to this point in Jesus' ministry, and certainly after, uh, he has been and will continue to be heavily challenged by the Pharisees and the, the Jewish ruling council, or religious leaders in Jerusalem, and the surrounding regions and towns. Uh, at this point in his ministry, Jesus is making his way towards Jerusalem and ultimately towards the cross. <clears throat> uh, the Pharisees and other Jewish religious leaders, for the most part, really weren't sure what to do with Jesus. Uh, he had drawn a huge following due to his teaching and the many miracles he performed. Jesus had also openly rebuked the hard-hearted, hypocritical, and self-serving ways of the Pharisees. Uh, many Jewish religious, religious leaders knew that they couldn't easily get rid of Jesus or make him go away like they wanted to, as he was threatening. He was threatening their credibility with the people and causing a major disturbance uh, in the religious and political system they had grown so prosperous and comfortable in. In the meantime, they sought to frustrate him, to invalidate him, or to get him to say something that would incriminate himself so that they could use it against him and justify punishing him, executing him, and getting the people to turn against him. They wanted to remove him and his movement uh, as quickly as possible. So while it's tempting to condemn all Pharisees, and when we read scripture, we tend to, at least I do, tend to kind of grip my teeth when I get to these parts of these guys that are seem to be coming out of nowhere uh, only for the sake of frustrating and contesting him. <clears throat> so it's tempting to condemn all Pharisees as we read through the Gospels, but we can't assume 
that each and every Pharisee who challenged or questioned Jesus had evil intentions. Because we know that some of them, they did believe, but they kept it to themselves because they feared man more than they feared God. And of course, there's some notable Pharisees um, in the Gospels like Nicodemus and Joseph of, of Arimathea. And these men and others uh, may have just genuinely wanted to question Jesus to get to know him better, to understand him better, so they could build that bridge and understanding between them and him. So even today, I would say that uh, just the humility and openness to Jesus' message are often the first steps towards repentance and belief. So being an expert of a Mosaic law, perhaps the lawyer was genuinely just a bit skeptical of Jesus and he wanted to test out his knowledge and understanding of the law. So as lawyers do, he takes the offensive stance and the role of the questioner by putting Jesus on the stand. He asks, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But Jesus quickly reverses uh, his own position to the offensive role and puts the lawyer himself on the stand by asking him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? <clears throat> Jesus is basically saying that you're supposed to be the, if you're supposed to be an expert, why don't you go ahead and explain to me how you understand it? So the lawyer answered, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love neighbors as yourself. Uh, pulling from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. So the lawyer's reply is a textbook answer, but it's also uh, a correct answer, an accurate way to sum up the Ten Commandments and all the commandments that extend from them. <clears throat> so Jesus replies to him and says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Jesus affirms that the lawyer has answered correctly and simply follows it by telling the lawyer, do this and you will live. Have a nice day, uh, essentially. But there was more to the lawyer's initial question and Jesus' response wouldn't be good enough for him to just let it sit there. So he wouldn't let the conversa conversation in and Luke says he wanted to justify himself. Meaning that he likely thought that Jesus' teaching was nothing new. So he wanted to be assured that by Jesus' understanding of the law, that he also was indeed worthy of eternal life. So surely he must have thought, if anyone's worthy of eternal life, it would have to be a person like me, or uh, it, would be, it would be me or a person like me. Sorry, wind uh, blowing me around a little bit here. <clears throat> so he wanted to have Jesus to uh, go ahead and confirm this for them, not, not only for him himself, but to those who were, who were listening to him. So he asked uh, that extra question. I don't know about you, but... Uh, Sometimes you ask that extra question that we probably shouldn't ask uh, to kind of make 100% sure that somebody understands, you know, how, how well we've done or, or exactly what we've done. And it's usually rooted out of a place of pride and insecurity. So that extra affirma affirmation gives us uh, that much desired confidence boost. But the response doesn't always go the way we hope. Sometimes we get surprised by the answer when we take that extra question. And that's what happened to this lawyer. So. <clears throat> so he followed up and asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Asking this question in itself exposes that the fact that the lawyer exposes the fact that the lawyer did not personally believe that the command would mean that all people should be considered his neighbors. He, he exposed himself there. <clears throat> and obviously this would probably include enemies and strangers and the like. So he likely expected to hear a more specific group of people that would qualify as being worthy of being proper neighbors in his mind, like fellow religious Jews in his community, or as a Pharisee, maybe he uh, excluded more ordinary or common people. Uh, maybe he only considered his neighbors to be more enlightened people like other, other Pharisees or experts in law. So when he asked the question, who is my neighbor to Jesus, the lawyer expected that the response and the follow would be another predictable kind of a slam dunk answer for him that would uh, ultimately justify him and his, his own righteousness. But Jesus did not answer him in the way he predicted. There's nothing wrong with the, the lawyer's desire for eternal life or his desire to be obedient to the law. The problem was the proud self-righteousness that came with this faulty question and he left the door open for Jesus to expose his heart and his lack of understanding. But Jesus did this for the lawyer's benefit. That is, if the lawyer truly wanted to have eternal life. So Jesus responds to the lawyer with a, with a parable. And he says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. The journey from Jerusalem to Jericho included a 17-mile road 
and connected that connected the two cities, descending roughly 3,300 feet uh, through rocky and desert terrain. So along this route, there were plenty of places where the robbers could hide and ambush unsuspecting or vulnerable travelers. So this type of attack could have essentially happened uh, to anybody, but and the parable happened to this, this lone traveler. And beyond the details of the attack that left the man half dead, we all we really know about the man is that he was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. So he was more than likely uh, a Jewish man making the trip back home from Jerusalem. In verse 31, 32, we read, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. <clears throat> so now Jesus introduces two new characters into the story uh, who both happen to be very privileged and respected men in the Jewish community. But unfortunately for the man in distress, they don't remain in the story for long. The, pre the priest and the Levite are also likely to be returning home from serving at the temple. So there may be some debate uh, or supporting reasons why the priest or the Levite didn't stop. But the point Jesus is trying to make here is that these two men were supposed to be the most, uh, two of the more devout and obedient men in their culture, and yet neither man bothered, bothered to stop to help, uh, let alone show the man mercy. <clears throat> neither could these men plead ignorance of the law. We often, often think about sin as just being a, a willful transgression of the law, of the known law of God, uh, which basically means that we know better, but we go ahead and do it anyway. But a sin of omission, on the other hand, is a failure to act on our part. It's not doing something that we ought to have done, and that is what the priest and Levi are guilty of here. <clears throat> so I imagine if the beaten man had seen these two men passing him by without offering for help, he probably would have been pretty heartbroken and, and maybe hurt as much emotionally as he was physically at the time. I'm sure we've all witnessed scenarios uh, in real life or on TV where we've watched shock and, walk and, watched in shock and disappointment when uh, bystanders would, wouldn't risk involving themselves into a situation to help somebody or a person in distress. Perhaps you yourself have been one of these bystanders or perhaps you've been the person in distress. And I recall times in my past when I've been in both positions. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, Jesus says, came to where the man was now the Samaritan enters into the story. Um, so after mentioning the priest and the Levite in this parable, I imagine that the last person that the lawyer and the listeners would have expected to end of the story would have been some of the people that they hated the most. Uh, the, <clears throat> the despicable Samaritans. <laughs> Anyone who's read the Gospels knows that it's no secret that the, that the Jews did not associate with the Samaritans. Uh, we even hear an account of uh, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus encounters a Samaritan woman, and she's surprised that he would even stop and, and talk to her or, or associate with her. Uh, the Jews considered the Samaritans to be half-breeds and heretics, heretics, and they outright rejected them. And they're certainly not people that they would want to consider their neighbors. So Jesus continues on and says, When he saw him, the Samaritan man, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So the Samaritan man's kindness puts the priest and the Levite to shame, and there's no debating it. Not only did he stop and check on the man, unlike the other two men, but he went much further than that. He put his compassion into action. He bandaged and nursed the man's wounds. He put put the man his own donkey and he brought him to, in, to the care farm. And we know that he at least spent one day caring for him himself before he had to leave. And once he left, he left enough uh, funds for the innkeeper to keep, continue taking care of him and assure him that he would uh, pay him back the rest when he returned. His love was selfless, it was self-sacrificing, and he expected nothing in return. We can't even assume this, the Samaritan man and the injured man would ever see each other again face to face. <clears throat> We can't assume that the Samaritan man would even have the opportunity to thank the man for what he'd done. But what a beautiful demonstration of love it is. So Jesus finally asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And at this point in the story, there's only one obvious answer and one correct answer, and the lawyer knows it. And he replies, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And that's the end of the parable. So we see here that Jesus' parable has done its work and the lawyer can only concede 
that his self-justifying question by asking who is my neighbor was faulty from the get-go. And it should have instead probably something more like, how can I better love my neighbors? If he was see uh, truly seeking eternal life and it means to glorify God by loving him with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. You see, the two, the two greatest commandments spoken by the lawyer at the beginning of this passage and also confirmed by Jesus in another passage are intertwined. The first and, uh, first and greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, mind, and strength, to essentially love him with everything you've got. And it can only be realized if we are also obedient to the second greatest commandment, which is to love your neighbors as yourselves. <clears throat> So we can't truly love our neighbors without first loving God with all that we have, because all that we have and hold dear, first and foremost, comes from him. To paraphrase the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Jesus said it's easy to only love those who love us, but it's not so much when it comes to those who we consider to be our enemies and persecutors. In the same passage, Jesus says, God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous meaning that God's love and goodness is actively shown to all people. Each day that we live and breathe on this earth and have life is a day that his grace has been extended to those, uh, even those who don't love him and serve him. And those who don't love and serve uh, the Lord may dispute such a claim, but those who do still seek and know that they can find the Lord's grace even in the most difficult times. <clears throat> so at this point you may be thinking, Thank you, Mike, but you haven't really told me anything I haven't already heard before. Uh, everybody knows this parable. Everyone's heard it at some point in their lives, probably. And uh, after all, it's kind of the, the golden rule we learn in elementary school. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Uh, which essentially means love your neighbors as yourself. And that would be fair. That's how you feel. But for the sake of a little spiritual prodding, let me ask you this. When you read or hear the parable of the Good Samaritan, which character do you usually identify with? I'm not sure about you, but over the years, and many times that I've read and heard this parable, I've always identified with either the two men passing by or the Samaritan man who stopped to help them. And there are times in my life when I played the role of the good Samaritan, but many others when I was a coward and I shied away from stepping in and helping the person when I should have. If anyone here today feels that they are one of those people, I apologize and I ask for your forgiveness. It's not something I'm proud of, but this parable has tuned me into my own uh, lack of mercy and empathy at times and even in recent months When you're feeling good about yourself and you're standing in God's kingdom It's probably more natural to reflect on your good deeds and identify with the Samaritan man When you've been missing the mark More often than not you might identify more with the two men who pass by and fail to show mercy and respond to the man's need in favor of their own fears and desires or whatever the excuse may have been, might have been So I humbly admit that after years of encountering this parable, I had never identified as the man who was robbed, beaten, stripped, and left half dead in the road. Before this, I felt a lot of shame when the realization hit me. It showed that I had grown accustomed to feeling as if I was always the one put in the, put in the position to either show or withhold mercy, but was never the one who was in need of it. So perhaps we can't know for certain, but I imagine that when Jesus started sharing this parable, by speaking about the plight of the man who was ambushed, the lawyer first identified with that man as Jesus introduced the priest and Levite who both walked by, and then the Samaritan who stopped and helped. The lawyer wouldn't have really cared that at his time of need, he wouldn't have cared at his time of need who the other men were or what their backgrounds were, only that he was in desperate need of mercy, and he was grateful for the one he stopped and offered it to him. <clears throat> and this essentially, on a, on a spiritual level, this is what, in, in a physical level, this is what God has done for us through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's not until we have received that kind of unmerited love and mercy that we can know how to show it to others. And it's not until we understand that we have received this kind of unmerited love and mercy that we can know that we should also show it to others. Jesus once rebuked a Pharisee's self-righteousness and hard-heartedness by contrasting it with a sinful woman's gratitude and humility. He said, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as a great love is shown, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So the Pharisee, like this lawyer uh, in, in, this, in this account, had placed himself in a position of power 
and as one who was righteous enough to either give or withhold mercy towards others. But he didn't see that he was the one in need of mercy himself. The woman, on the other hand, had genuinely repented of her sin and recognized her own need for mercy and forgiveness. Therefore, she was filled with love, gratitude, and humility, for she knew she had received it. <clears throat> so we must recognize that spiritually, apart from God's love, grace, and mercy, we, like this man in Jesus' parable, perpetually live as people who have been ambushed by Satan and his schemes. We've been robbed of our humility and stripped of our love and compassion. Satan has left us left for dead in the middle of this road we call life, and that is where he intends to keep us if he can. But God does not shy away uh, and mercil mercilessly pass us by and leave us for dead. He came, to rescue, he came to our rescue so that we could live. He nursed our wounds to soothe our pain. He clothed us so that we wouldn't have to lie naked and exposed in the middle of the road. He led us to safety so that we could heal, be restored, and go do the same for others. He has adopted us as sons and daughters into his eternal family and left us the gift of the Holy Spirit who leads us into love, truth, and righteousness. He promised to return and give us an eternal inheritance that nothing this world can ever touch. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. <clears throat> so I'm sure everybody re recognizes that right now we're in the midst of a pretty intense spiritual warfare in our, in our nation, in our communities. And I plead with you today, don't let, don't let the fear and the anger and the frustrations and the uncertainties of this world overtake you. It's done, it's done this to so many others in our world and our nation. We need to know that God is in control now, just as he's always been. What we, see are the what we see today are the attributes of a fallen world and fallen people, and we are called to be that salt and light. And called to be those who bring love, hope, peace, and joy to a broken world. Let us not be the ones who contribute to its pain and suffering by walking in the darkness. 1 John 2, 9 through 11 said, says, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. <clears throat> let us not walk in the darkness, but let us be like the Good Samaritan and, show, and instead show patience, gentleness, compassion, and love in action to those who are in need of mercy and kindness. kindness. Toler tolerance does not mean agreement, but it should still be offered with love and respect. Let us also show love to those who hate us, to those who disagree with us, to those who might look different from us with different uh, backgrounds, to those whose actions we may even disapprove of. Let us be proper ambassadors of Christ who represent his love and his character accurately to a world and a nation of people who desperately need it. Today I'm asking you to identify with a beaten man and to recognize your need for mercy. For the Apostle Paul says in Romans 3, 23 through 24, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the good shepherd. <clears throat> and Apostle Paul also says uh, the fruit of the Spirit, which is what we want to live by, is, is joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been, crucified, have been crucified with the flesh, with its desires and passions. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So today, as we uh, prepare to partake in the Lord's Supper together, I'd ask you to go ahead and, uh, and take out the elements, please. Um, at, as we prepare, I, I ask that you would all come to the table with worthy hearts that are full of humility and gratitude and light of what the Lord has done for us. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And be thankful. Let us pray. This is my prayer. Uh, dear Lord, I pray today that we would all recognize that we, we have received that ultimate gift of your grace, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we're so thankful, Lord, that, that you loved us enough to send your son to pay the price that we couldn't pay. Lord, I pray that today, as a benediction, that we would go and do as a good Samaritan did, Lord. And to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love our neighbor as ourselves by demonstrating this selfless, uh, self-sacrificial love that expects nothing in return, Lord. May you place that uh, motivation in our heart today, Lord. And may we do it all just to glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to... Um sing that little chorus from When We All Get to Heaven as our closing today. And Tom is going to come up to and uh, give us a, a more detailed announcement about the, uh, the revival we're having this coming weekend. Good morning. Good morning. Just want to make sure that everyone is clear about what's going on this coming Friday. We are so excited to have the Bullocks joining us on Friday evening. They're going to be preaching and singing and all of that. So on Friday at six o'clock, we will be at the war. Uh, Pastor Edmund Bullock will be preaching. His family will be singing and we'll be in full worship on Friday at the war. On Saturday, the group that he's part of, Devoted, will actually be giving a full concert. So if you would like to come out on the war again, on Saturday at 6, there will be a full concert given by Devoted. And then on Sunday, we'll be back here on the square at 10 a.m. And, and Pastor Bullock will be delivering the word and his family will be singing again. So we are very excited. So we hope that you will join us on Friday evening at 6 and then again on Saturday for the concert. And then back here on the square Sunday morning at 10 a.m. God bless you. Thank you, Tanya. So, you got your weekend plan. All right, join us as we sing this little chorus. Bless you all. It was an honor and a privilege to be able to bring the message. Uh, pray y'all have a great rest of your holiday weekend, and uh, may God bless you. Amen.